My name is Henry Gonzalez. I serve as Agricultural Commissioner and Sealer of Weights and Measures for the County of Monterey. And this, this morning, it's my, uh, my privilege to present the 2019 Annual Crop Report. And for the first time ever, the Monterey County Cannabis Production Report as well. So today, to help uh, all of this along, I've uh, asked a number of our industry experts to assist me with some of the detail that, that I'm not aware of, but that, that they are, some of their insights. And so uh, I want to introduce the, them uh, next. So uh, from the California Strawberry Commission, we have Carolyn O'Donnell. She is the Director of Communications, Communications Director. We also have Kim Stemmler. She is the Director of the Vintners and Growers Association, uh, representing the Monterey County Farm Bureau is Colby Pereira. She is the president of the Board of Directors. And we also have Chris Valavez, president of the Grower Shippers Association of Central California. And we have Aaron Johnson of the Coastal Growers Association. Those are our uh, official um, representatives, but uh, uh, a little bit out of uh, out of the agenda, but uh, I do see that we have Bob Roach on there, who is uh, also with the uh, Monterey County Cannabis uh, Association. I probably got that wrong, Bob. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, since you are on, uh, you might get picked on uh, by the press for some some questions as well. So those are the the experts that are on uh, the the call with us. And so we're going to get going here. Um, I think those are all the introductions. Uh, I, I do have a long list of people to thank. Uh, from our staff, we have Rich Ordnance, Graham Hunting, Shayla Neufeld, uh, Yvonne Perez, uh, and Myra. I should have wrote her last name. Uh, she's new for the department. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, memories uh, not that great anymore. But uh, they're the ones that put this report together. They're the ones that went out, went out and collected the information and compiled it into this great report. Uh, this great report would be just a bunch of numbers, uh, uh, except for those of us that love numbers. So every year we try to spice up the, the crop report by adding a, a theme. Uh, a story, as it were, something about agriculture that we believe is uh, interesting and will make it um, that much better. And so this year we, we selected invasive species to, to spice up the, the crop report. Uh, invasive species, for those of you that may not remember, they are those bugs, uh, can be viruses, bacteriums, uh, vertebrae or invertebrate pests, uh, uh, can be many different things that are uh, attacking agriculture or the natural environment, things that we don't already have in the environment. Uh, those are we refer to as invasive species and they're of most concern. We already have the, the other pests that we deal with on an annual basis, uh, but then these invasives are pests that we don't have and we don't want. Uh, and if we do get any of them, we do our best to, to get rid of them. So in this year's crop report, that's what we chose to, to highlight. Um, uh, and the, the crop report also includes a number of vignettes and a uh, kind of a short article about invasive species to tell the, the story as well. So I wanna thank the, the, the writers who put those vignettes together and the article. That would be Heather Healy, Tim Lewis, and Hannah Wallace. Uh, also want to um, give them kudos for, for that work uh, and encourage everyone to read that. So for those of you that may not know, the, uh, the reason we, we don't want invasive species, uh, it's not just because we have enough pests to deal with, but we do. But the other important reason is that if we get one of these invasive species, one of these pests here, 
uh, it generally triggers quarantines by other states and other countries, uh, quarantines that impact our ability to export to those jurisdictions. And generally, it means that more pesticides have to be used to control or eradicate those pests. And, and then also there's additional requirements such as inspections, trapping, uh, certifications, which just adds to the cost of uh, farming. So we want to avoid that uh, because farming is already uh, expensive. So we don't, we don't want to do that. Uh, we also have a, a video, Arms Arm Productions uh, put together a, a great video as they do for us every year. And so we're going to be showing that uh, uh, in, in a few moments. Uh, and that is uh, that video production, uh, thanks to Maya Carroll. Uh, she's uh, the county's, uh, uh, I want to say PIO, but uh, I probably got that wrong too. Uh, but uh, the, the video uh, has to do with invasive species and it has to do with the Ag Department's efforts here, our Monterey County Ag Commissioner's Office efforts to, number one, detect these these invasive species as soon as they get here so that we can deal with it. So I won't say any more because the, uh, the video itself will, will speak to that. The Monterey County Ag Commissioner protects your agricultural crops and the natural environment in many different ways. We have a pest exclusion program where we try to keep pests out of Monterey County to begin with. We have a pest detection program where we constantly monitor the natural environment and our agricultural crops. And we have a pest management program where we go out and control and manage pests that are currently present in the county. The Monterey County Agricultural Commissioner's Office uh, works many different programs in order to keep invasive species out of the county. One of those services is pest detection, where we go out and we place traps out in, among the county, is uh, all throughout the county to trap for invasive species. This is agricultural assistant, Manuel Mendoza. He's demonstrating the placement of the uh, Asian, Asian citrus psyllid trap. This trap is just a yellow sticky trap that doesn't have a pheromone to it. It has a glue substance on it that hopes to trap the insect as it flies by. The placement of this trap is on the outside of the tree in full sunlight that uh, is something that attracts the Asian citrus psyllid to the yellowness um, that re is reflected from the sun. Here Manuel's demonstrating the placement of a Mediterranean fruit fly trap. This trap goes inside of the tree in full shade. This trap utilizes a female pheromone to attract the male to it and hopes to attract the Mediterranean fruit fly if there is one present. Here Manny's demonstrating the placement of what we call a McPhail trap. This is a general fruit fly trap that uses yeast mixed with borax to attract insects to it so that way they get trapped inside of it to kill. This is a general fruit fly trap so it could trap anything from the Mediterranean fruit fly to the melon fruit fly, oriental fruit fly, as well as the Mexican fruit fly, all of which are invasive species uh, throughout California. The Mediterranean fruit fly trap here that utilizes the pheromone has to be close to uh, mature rotting fruit in order to help attract the fly. The McPhail trap can go into a tree that doesn't have as much fruit or non, not quite mature fruit. The smell that it releases helps attract the fruit fly to it. Our early detection and rapid response approach means that problems are addressed early while they're small and manageable. This means that if we have to use chemical control methods, we use as little as possible. We also try to time our applications well so that we're making these applications when the pest is most vulnerable. We run these programs to protect our local agricultural industry, which is a $4.4 billion industry um, that could be devastated if we got a non-native invasive species here in Monterey County. These pests can degrade our crops by reducing the quality of the commodities that are produced and by reducing production. They can also be lethal to our crops, causing devastation of these crops, which would result in huge economic losses. We trap quite a few different types of invasive species, including urban fruit flies, like the Mediterranean fruit fly, the Oriental fruit fly. We also trap for things like the gypsy moth and the Japanese beetle, as well as moths, like the European grapevine moth, and the new one that we're trapping for now, which is the European grape berry moth, out in vineyards throughout Monterey County, all the way down to San Ardo. Our most recent infestation was with Asian citrus psyllid in the Soledad area. We were successful at eradicating that pest from the area 
by using biocontrol methods and working with the California Department of Food and Agriculture to remove infested trees and to treat infested areas. If you happen to see any pests of concern or interest, feel free to call us so that we can help you determine whether or not this is something of interest. Very good. Uh, I, I think we'll have that on our website uh, and it's a great educational tool as well. Add to our, our little library of, of uh, annual crop report videos. Wanna also thank the, uh, the stars of the video. Uh, that was uh, Hannah Wallace, our agricultural biologist, uh, Tim Lewis, uh, deputy ag commissioner, uh, and Manuel Mendoza, one of our agricultural aides. Uh, so, so I want to um, share that uh, this this cover on the on the crop report is a a thumbs up. It's a two thumbs up uh, to the the old horror monster movies of the fifties and the sixties. Um, this one here kind of reminds me of. Uh, Mothra back in the day, but I want to thank uh, Moxie um, for putting together Moxie Marketing for putting together this this really beautiful crop report. Uh, I I don't I think I made it kind of hard for them by by describing what I what I envisioned and and they've done uh, a, a marvelous job with the the design and the and the artwork. Uh, So I'm just going to go on to the, let's see, oh, that does work. So in this uh, crop report, uh, since the, the theme is uh, invasive species, we have, this is the article that I mentioned, uh, the authors are, and again, I need to thank uh, Heather Healy, again, Hannah Wallace and, and Tim Lewis for this, uh, this excellent uh, uh, article. It's, it's short and sweet uh, that I think uh, people will, will enjoy and and I hope uh, learn a little bit more about invasive species. So in, in this crop report, we follow the, the invasive species theme and put down some, uh, some, of the, some of the top 10 California invasive pests. And uh, you know, depending on where you're at uh, and what you're growing and what you value, uh, these pests uh, may or may may be of greater or lesser concern for you, uh, but I'll, I'll share with you that in in the recent past we've had the the glassy wing sharpshooter here, we've had the Asian citrus psyllid here, which was mentioned in the the video, we've uh, had detections of the Japanese beetle, the light brown apple moth, and the European grape moth. So grapevine moth. Uh, so these are not just uh, pests that um, uh, that uh, we're concerned with and that we don't have, we are concerned with them, and we generally don't have them. But uh, from time to time, they do uh, come into the county, and uh, our plan is always to eradicate the population when it's just one or two or just a few when it's it's easy to eradicate, and not after the population has become established, and then. Uh, it's, it's much more work, much more cost for the state and for the county, uh, much more pesticides and uh, something that we don't want to, uh, to do. Uh, and, and we certainly don't want those populations to become established because again, the quarantine requirements, the restrictions and all the other problems, uh, we don't want that to be uh, a forever thing. So we're, we, we seek to detect these pests as soon as they get here and eradicate them before they can become established. So uh, drum roll, please. Uh, this is the, the big number, the big reveal here is that for 2019, the overall production of agriculture in the county went up by 3.5% from 4 billion, that's billion with a B, 4 billion, 200 and 
$58,629,000. It went up to $4 billion, $409,992,000. So that's a, a, a large number. And I, I have to say that from that number, this is not a number uh, that the growers get to take home. This is a number that they receive for their crops in the field. And from that number, they must pay uh, their workers, they must pay their, their taxes, their fuel bill, land leases, fertilizer, seed, uh, everything has to be paid out of that number. And then that number, those dollars circulate through our, throughout our economy and have a, a multiplier effect. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, it's always good news. Uh, if we're going up, um, then if we're going down. And so for 2019, we did go up in, in uh, total production uh, value anyway of 3.5%. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna also now speak a little bit about some of the, the categories of, of uh, crops that we, that we uh, group to kind of track the, the, the value overall and for some of the specific categories. Oh, there it is. So for, for vegetable crops, and, and I have to say that vegetable crops is, our, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought I heard some, someone ask a question. So for 2019, the gross production value for, for vegetable crops, which is our, our biggest category, this is what, uh, you know, we're not known as the salad bowl of the world for nothing, and we grow lots of vegetables here. And so we went up in value 7.9 increase from $2,871,099,000 uh, up to $3,099,088,000. Uh, so uh, again, always good to see that we're moving in the right direction here. But uh, uh, before I, I uh, go to the next slide, I, I will say that uh, always is the case uh, and, and not different than 2019, but there's always crops that are gaining in value and other crops that are going down in value. And, and that, that just happens uh, over time and it's a slow process. These, these jumps up and jumps down uh, do occur uh, and, and we have to look at the, the overall trends, but there's nothing to be concerned about if something goes down a little bit the next year it's likely to go up. Uh, but there are some trends where we have seen where some commodities and some commodity groups are going down uh, while others are going up and I'll, I'll mention those. So the, the next big category that we have are, are fruit and nut crops. And here we actually had a decrease in value and it was a small decrease, 1.5%. Uh, we went from 1 billion 43 million 856,000 in 2018 to 1,028,146,000 uh, dollars in uh, 2019. A, a slight uh, decrease in uh, here's our uh, our another category: our nursery and flower crops. Uh, this was also a a decrease, and this was a significant decrease. And this is one of the cases where we've seen a decrease. It actually started in 2008, and we've seen uh, just decreasing uh, uh, sales, production of uh, nursery crops and, and cut flowers. So uh, again, this is a significant drop uh, from uh, 204 million, 289, thousand dollars in 2018 to 143 million nine hundred and forty nine thousand dollars in 2019 so uh, we we know that these these drops are uh, just uh, housing primarily a lot of folks are not uh, there's not a lot of housing being built so there's a lot of not a lot of use for 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 nursery crops uh, and then cut flowers were just out competed by, by other countries. Here's the other, the other categories of crops. Uh, uh, they didn't change uh, too much except for seed and apiary. 
but uh, livestock and poultry was was really stable from 2018 to 2019 with uh, uh, just a uh, $18,000 decrease in value. Uh, then we saw that field crops uh, had a 3.4% uh, uh, increase, uh, uh, but then we saw seed and apiary that had a uh, pretty significant uh, uh, decrease of 27.6%. And these, uh, the decrease in, in, in seed production is just, they're just an overall, just less acreage being grown of seed crops in the county. And then with apiary, uh, there was some uh, a reduction in the the number of hives used for for pollination, and part of that had to do with uh, uh, bad weather that that we experienced. And so here are the uh, the, the top ten. I always like to track the the, the top crops, and uh, the top ten this year uh, is the same as last year, uh, with uh, leaf lettuce as number one, strawberries as number two. Uh, but uh, interestingly, the, uh, the, uh, although it's the same 10 crops, they, they did change order. The biggest change in being that salary moved from, in 2018, it was in the ninth spot. And, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, in the ninth spot and then moved to the, uh, the seventh spot here um, in 2019. And then wine grapes, which had a, a fantastic year last year, and was in fifth place, uh, um, now is in uh, eighth place. So uh, that's just the, the bouncing up and down of these, uh, these commodities as they, they seek uh, to find a stable uh, place where uh, the production and, and the value, the supply and demand all works out uh, to the benefit of all. Organic production. Uh, these numbers are included in the production numbers of all the commodities, <clears throat> but uh, organic uh, is one of the, uh, continues to be a bright spot uh, here in the county as, as other places in the state. And we've had an increase in, uh, in, in production and in, in value. Let's see, the, uh, the, Acres went up to 89,566, and the value went up to $562,702,000. So that uh, continues to go up, and uh, I, I really don't see that that's going to, to change in the foreseeable future. We always like to show how much uh, we, we uh, export, and we do export quite a bit. Although that uh, that uh, three hundred and twenty seven million four hundred ninety four thousand pounds of produce that we exported in twenty nineteen is actually a, a reduction uh, in pounds exported, a reduction of seventeen point nine percent. So that generally means less less uh, less exports. Uh, the, the previous year, in 2018, we had 398,985,000 pounds of uh, produce that we exported out of the county. Uh, I, I will say that those are not all Monterey County uh, pounds of produce. Uh, we do export uh, uh, for the, the uh, adjoining counties, Santa Cruz and San Benito, some of Santa Clara. But since we have the, the packing uh, facilities and the processing facilities, it all gets exported out of, out of here. So that, some of that includes those other counties as well. And then just a list of our trading partners, just so, so to make people aware. And these are, these are the, the main uh, partners, but uh, there are many more. Uh, I, I think we, we export to almost every county, I mean, uh, country, except for uh, a few that, that were prohibited to, uh, to do business with. So uh, I think many folks have been uh, anxiously awaiting the, uh, this uh, particular slide in this particular report of uh, the 2019 cannabis production in the county, the first ever. This is thanks to uh, efforts by uh, many. Uh, this was the, the brainchild of uh, our supervisor, uh, Luis Alejo, 
And this was uh, supported and sponsored by the, the County of Monterey and authored by our own Senator Bill Monty. So because of this, uh, this allows the Agricultural Commissioner uh, if, to, to report these numbers. So uh, when, you, when you finally and eventually get a, a copy of the, of the crop report, you'll find in the very middle this cannabis production report and it, it's not stapled in, it's uh, stuck in there with uh, uh, whatever it is, that sticky material that is used like on credit cards. Uh, but uh, so you can pull that out and keep it separate. And that's, that's in following the, uh, the letter of the law and to respect the, uh, the federal government and uh, 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 their view of cannabis not being a legal crop. So we want to keep those separate since uh, our crop reports do end up uh, with the federal government for uh, purposes of, uh, for a number of purposes, but uh, just to respect that and to keep that, uh, we did include it, but you can pull it out if you like. So uh, this is all too, too much to read, but I uh, do want to share that we, we added some, uh, a little bit of uh, background information, some of the history of, of how we got here, a little bit about what I just mentioned about uh, a Supervisor Alejo's idea to get this uh, cannabis production numbers into the crop report and how that all transpired. We also have information about the, the licenses in here, the state required licenses, the permitting that is required here by the county. And then also a uh, uh, little bit of information about the, the tax rate and, and revenue. Thought that was fair to include in here. And so uh, I think the, the very next slide uh, is going to give us uh, what we've been uh, looking for. Um, so the, we, we've added some tables to further describe the value of the cannabis production. And we, we did it according to the, the various types of licenses and we broke it down into uh, not only uh, the pounds, but I think also, also in here, uh, the number of square feet. And these are the, the various uh, categories of, of value right here. Uh, and, and they already revealed the, the overall value, which I should get a, a drum roll here, but uh, the overall production value for the, the limited acreage was 86 acres. And over the span of one year, 449,688,000 was, was generated uh, with cannabis uh, sales. Now, I, again, I'll mention that, yes, that's a big number, but from that number, the cannabis growers have to pay everybody for that, uh, all of their workers, all of their, their taxes, their fuel, their leases, their... Uh, everything has to get paid out of there and hopefully they have some left for themselves. Doesn't always work that way, but uh, that's kind of the idea. But uh, uh, this is not what the, the cannabis growers take home. This is what uh, they generate and from there, uh, everybody must be paid. And uh, that's actually a, a very impressive number for a first year crop. I don't think that's ever happened in the history of the world, but, the, but there it is, $449,688,000, almost four and a half million dollars on 86 acres in one year. So all of the information that we have in the crop report and in the cannabis production report are all um, because of the growers and the ag companies uh, sharing their, their data with us. And we don't share the data that they shared with us. We compile it and put it together and then we present it. But individual grower information, we never share that. Individual companies, we never share that. Uh, that's uh, their business. Uh, but I want to thank the Coastal Growers Association uh, for uh, their assistance, the Monterey County Cannabis Industry Association, uh, Monterey County Vintners and Growers Association, the California Strawberry Commission, Grower Shippers Association of Central California, and the Farm Bureau 
uh, as well. Uh, anyway, with that, uh, we're going to move on to uh, the next segment, which is our, our, our panel of industry uh, experts. They're going to provide you with their thoughts on the 2019 production uh, value. And then uh, some, they're going to share some of their insights and, and comments. Why don't we start with uh, Carolyn uh, o O'Donnell, please? Good morning. Thank you so much, Henry. I love the new theme. I almost decided to be an entomologist when I was in college, so happy to see all those bugs. Um, I just wanted to say that um, for the strawberry industry, we're still number two in Monterey County, um, and it has to do with the fabulous growing conditions that we enjoy in mostly mo northern Monterey County. Pretty much when you get south of Gonzales, it's just too hot for strawberries. So most of that strawberry production is focused in the north. Um, if you note in the report, there is less acreage that was planted in 2019. So of course we expect the production to be lower, which is reflected in the report. Um, but we also saw there was less production per acre and, um, and a pretty significant change. And usually that's all about the weather. And um, if anyone can remember back to May of 2019, um, we had a pretty significant rain event happen in the second half of May, just as this area was getting ramped up in their um, prime production season. So that definitely had an impact on um, the production for that season. However, you'll see that the value went up. And that's also the tale of strawberries because they're a very perishable crop. Often when the volume goes down, the value goes up. People are willing to pay more for those berries because there are fewer of them available. Um, but that value, as Henry mentioned, does not reflect what goes back to the farmers. And strawberry farming is very capital intensive, very labor intensive. And um, generally, we, when we kind of break down on a dollar, what for each dollar that shows up in value, what does come back to the grower? And in a good year, it could be between one and 3%. In a not so great year, it could go into the negative. That's not unusual as well. Um, we have significant labor costs within strawberries because it is a hand planted, hand weeded, hand harvested crop. And we have a very long harvest season. It's not just one harvest and we're done, but we're harvesting the same land over and over and over, over many months. Um, so that, that all feeds into that production costs as well. So the return, while the value looks great, doesn't mean that the, um, the growers are, are taking um, a lot of, of profit out of that. Also, you might note in the processing section, which is certainly a, an important part of the strawberry market, it is down. Um, some of that will vary from year to year depending on the capacity in the freezers. Sometimes if they have enough product left over from last year, they can't really take in a lot more. Um, also, it will reflect the price of strawberry. Sometimes when um, the strawberry price for fresh is not looking so great or um, they will divert to the freezer as well. So um, again, it sometimes is a story of the weather, sometimes a story of the market, sometimes a story of just what's being held in the freezer right now. So it's certainly not unusual for it to fluctuate from year to year. So um, that's, that's the story of strawberries in 2019. Um, this year, we're expecting just a sneak peek as we are expecting, despite all the challenges we're having with COVID-19, we do expect we'll probably have a similar year this year. We're pretty much in line with the previous two years. Very good. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, I should You're have welcome. mentioned in case folks haven't seen the, uh, the agenda, but uh, uh, we will take questions of the, the panelists uh, after all of them have uh, given their initial uh, in, impressions. Uh, so why don't we go on to uh, Chris Valadez next, President of the Grower Shippers Association of Central California. Chris? Sure, thank you, Henry, and, and thank you, everybody else. I think, I think for me, looking at this report and seeing, you know, it from a, a granular level with respect to acreage changes and pricing changes and, and, and what, that, what that projects, I, I, I also like to look at, at a report such as this one from a from a very broad elevated level. And so for me, the thoughts that I'm left with really are one over, but the values help signal, uh, at least for us, and I think the projection really is a wherewithal of, of any commodity sector that's identified in this report to either be sustained or in some cases flourish. Um, but I think the importance to all that is, 
is whether it's, it's, it's in, you see increases or you see decreases and you look at the differences in pricing and, and acreage and it's affected by weather and affected by other conditions. I think ultimately what, what goes somewhat un, uncaptured in a report like this, but, but ultimately helps to determine the values and what a report like this ultimately publishes is what is ultimately paid, accepted, or established by, by the buyer, retailer community, and ultimately the consumer. And I, I, think, I think that is critical. Um, you know, you look at what I would call the advantages of, of farming and operating in, in Monterey County in, in specific where Carolyn identified the, the weather related qualities, the soil qualities, the, the natural qualities, um, the infrastructure created qualities with respect to water, water conveyance, um, you know, all the attributes that we have. I even think the concentration of this valley, um, the one-on-one -on -one corridor within the valley that allows um, crops, I think, to be moved uh, from, from field and where, you know, additional handling and processing is required, particularly not only in field, but, but indoors, um, you, you have the opportunity to, to locate um, close to or along the corridor and or within cities such as Salinas um, processing facilities to help handle um, and create value added products ultimately for the consumer and ultimately as dictated by the marketplace. And so for me, um, while this is only, you know, farm gate limited, I, I do think, you know, there is a signal here where you see increases, particularly as it relates to, to acreage, um, which to me signals volume demand and therefore the differences in pricing that that helps tell for me a story um, you know, what, what's, the, what's the consumer saying? What, what's the demand? Um, you know, what, what more, you know, how, where are we going with regard to, if you're looking at trends, you know, what, what are the trends for the commodities in this region? Um, and how are we, I think as a community, and I think this report isn't just a, a, a something that's a value in an ag silo, I think it has a, a community-wide significance, particularly for this region. You know, what, what does it say with regard to the region, region's um, own ability to be resilient, uh, sustain itself, and ultimately, uh, along with the industry, flourish. And I think those are, those are really important messages that aren't, aren't necessarily spotlighted or highlighted with, you know, a, a top 10 ranking or, you know, X billion and where we rank amongst other California counties. But I think I think the signal over wherewithal and what the values mean, I, I think it tells a story in terms of what, what is the state of, of the county's um, you know, agricultural wherewithal and health. And I think the trends tell us you know, where, where we've been and, and where we project to go. And so um, I would just wanna leave everybody on, on the Zoom meeting and, and the press with, with thoughts that I think ultimately here you have agricultural operations that, that have and continue to position themselves to be, um, you know, um, preferred producers for the commodities that we're able to produce, taking advantage of, of the natural and, and engineered benefits that we've created here that, that allows us to grow a diversity of, of crops, high value crops for a long period of time. And, and I think that's an advantage here and it's imperative onto us to see how that that interrelates, particularly over the long season. It isn't, you know, just a, a month deal. It's it's a multi-month deal, almost two thirds, if not longer, three fourths of a year, uh, in many cases for some commodities. How how that is impactful to the to the long-term longevity of, of this region, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us now as ag and a community to recognize like what that means and what those values signify. So so with that, Henry, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, let's go on now to uh, hear from um, from Colby Pereira, uh, president of the board of directors of the Monterey County Farm Bureau. Colby, please. Yes, good morning and, and thank you, Henry. You know, um, I'll echo comments that our executive director, Norm Group, has made in the past. Um, you know, farming is full of risks, whether it's weather related or market conditions or a plethora of different production related risks, such as having enough hands to harvest and mature crops or disease and pest impact on yield and quality. I want to 
wanted to say we appreciate the team at the Ag Commissioner's Office highlighting the invasive species in this year's crop report. Um, we found it to be very informative and a great thing to follow up with. So thank you for um, highlighting that area and offering some educational component to this year's crop report. Um, in terms of diving into the data a little bit, Henry, I think you did a really good job capturing a lot of the high level points. Um, just a couple more notations that I had made while reading the report. We did see that the number one crop of leaf lettuce, in addition, head lettuce this year both had market recoveries in 2019 after a 2018 slump. Um, additionally, cabbage, the value and the acreage of potentially due to asparagus maybe being down, um, associated with high labor costs. Um, as I noted, only 552 acres of asparagus planted in 2019, which was down from the previous year. Um, in addition, they counted, we also saw hot potatoes that increased in value and in acreage planted. Um, cabbage and broccoli both carry strong educational value, which led to some commercial lettuce planting. So, um, that was really nice to see. Um, celery, like you mentioned, Henry, the, the value was up while the total acreage was actually slightly down, which um, poses the question of what are we seeing done with different celery products? I know at the end of 2019, we did see um, celery juicing became quite a popular trend. So as you're seeing higher value added products being made with some of the commodities, it'll be interesting to see if that trend holds for 2020. Uh, lastly, um, exports continue to decline, um, kind of due to trade war impacts and negotiations to confirm the U.S. and Canada agreement. Um, Canada, in particular, was quite significant down. Um, however, with the passage of U.S. NCA and having it being ratified by all three countries, um, its, effective its effective date of July 1st, 2020, um, will hopefully be realized. Um, again, I think as it, my colleagues have captured a lot of the key points, I'll be brief with my remarks and just thank you again to um, the Ag Commissioner Office and team for compiling a really thorough crop report. Um, we have much to be thankful for um, amongst the bountiful production here in Monterey County. Thank you. Thank you, Colby. Uh, uh, the, the audio was cutting in and out, at least on my side, a little bit. Uh, uh, so. Um, Hopefully that was only on my side, uh, but uh, just when I was going to say something, uh, the audio would come back. Uh, and anyway, uh, uh, why don't we move on now to uh, uh, Kim Stemmler, Executive Director of the Monterey County Vintners and Growers Association. Kim? Hi. Uh, thank you for letting me be here. And I want to know, you to know I have my Salinas Valley celery, carrot, and kale juice right here. Ah, okay. So first, thank you, Henry, and to your staff for doing this. And I also want to thank you for your ongoing partnership. Um, we have worked together through COVID so much. And also your team works with the wine industry every month. We have a monthly meeting of our growers and your team is there as well. So thank you for your support. I don't, I don't know that the public knows that we have that level of cooperation and that's really important. Um, so Chris, thank you so much for bringing up the theme of resiliency of the industry. Uh, 2019 was not the easiest time for the wine industry nor probably is 2020. Uh, there have been very positive aspects, but there's been a lot of hindrances as well. We actually have a net effect of a 25% decrease in the value of grapes. Forget our drop in, in the ca categories in the county. Um, this is after a record value last year of approximately 248 million. And it brings us back down to an equivalent of around 2015. So why, why did this happen? And it is a very complex story. First, I'm gonna start with what wine grapes are. Wine grapes are a perennial specialty crop. So it's not something you can just plant for a few weeks and lift out. You actually need to plant a vine and it could take three to five years before you get grapes that can be used in wine. So it is a long-term investment. 
Um, because grapevines are perennial, they're really strongly affected by the climate and the other elements of terroir. So terroir is a term that's used in wine all the time. And basically it means everything natural, everything in nature, and it all affects vineyards. So the last few years have actually been really wonderful in terms of climate. Uh, it's been fairly mild. It has rained when it was okay to rain. Um, and it's rained a lot when it was okay to rain. Um, and I would say the 2018 and 2019 vintages are really superior vintages of wine. So from a quality perspective, they're very good. You should go buy them. From a quantity perspective, with nature's cooperation, and it is not only in Monterey County, but throughout the, the state, um, they've been abundant years. So this has created market pressure. We have a lot of what we would call juice on the market. We have a lot of grapes on the market, and there is not the demand to um, manage those grapes, to buy those grapes, to absorb those grapes. So a fallacy that has come out recently throughout the country is that uh, wine grape sales are plummeting, uh, wine, excuse me, that wine sales are plummeting. That is actually not true. Wine sales continue to increase nationally. They are just increasing at a slower rate. So whereas a couple of years ago, it would have been an increase of approximately 4%, and I can get you those exact percentages. You know, last year it was an increase of 2%. So it continues to increase just at a slower rate. Uh, so, but that means there's less of demand. Um, so what we're not seeing in the data collected, and this is information that's not collected throughout the state, is because our growers knew there was a lot of extra grapes on the market and we were coming into another year of abundance, they dropped a lot of grapes. We would say that they didn't harvest, but really they do harvest because it's bad for the vines if they don't harvest. But those grapes, a lot of grapes never made it to the winery. So they are not included in any of these numbers. And one of the things that's really interesting to see is that the actual value of each ton of Monterey grapes, um, it has increased by 1.2%. So our value of tonnage is staying the same. It's just that we're not taking a lot of those grapes to be sold or into wineries. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and again, this is, these are pressures we're seeing throughout the state. Um, the other pressure we're seeing, and again, throughout the state, and we work with our partners at the Ag Commission, we work with our partners in Napa and in Lodi about this, um, is pest-driven viruses, not COVID. Um, we were before COVID. <laughs> so a number of local vineyards actually have zero tolerance for these viruses. So if they see these airborne viruses that are driven by different kinds of insects that are, yes, um, they will start pulling vineyards. Um, and then they replant new vineyards. And, and that just adds more pressure more pressure all around to vineyards. So I really appreciate this very cool looking cover um, about invasive species because we definitely are paying attention to that in this region. Um, and again, growing grapes is a really complex dance between nature and the pressures of an international market. And it's going to change every year. Our growers, um, the more I get to know them, the more I realize they're really risk takers. Um, as is all ag and, uh, and they love this community. They'll keep on growing uh, and they'll continue to be partners. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. All right, so now we're gonna move on to uh, uh, cannabis and have uh, Aaron Johnson of the Monterey County Coastal Growers Association. Uh, Aaron, please. Thank you. Uh, well, my name is Aaron Johnson. Um, I'm a third generation uh, Salinas Valley resident. Um, I come from a family of lettuce growers, broccoli growers, and wine grape growers. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to be in this position today. <clears throat> Over the last uh, 22 years of law practice, I have been involved with agricultural issues uh, pretty much the entire time in one form or another. And uh, it has led me to participate uh, in Farm Bureau as a board, uh, a board member, 
Uh, I've been a, a past president of Cas uh, Monterey County Cattlemen's Association, uh, as well as participating in as a president of uh, Agland Trust, uh, which is uh, there to preserve Agland. Um, all of those experiences basically uh, helped me work with some others uh, like Joey Espinoza, who, who contributed to this report. Um, to form Coastal Growers Association. And this is an association primarily of, of uh, growers. We do have some other manufacturers, et cetera, that are in, the, in, the, uh, in our association, but uh, most of them are, are cultivators. <clears throat> um, so we modeled our, our association after how Farm Bureau and how uh, Grower Shipper and uh, these other organizations basically set up by committees and uh, talk about policy, et cetera. And so um, I'm just incredibly proud that we're here today because one of our missions from the start has been to uh, be a part of agriculture as an agricultural commodity. And uh, today, in my opinion, is a historic day, uh, largely because we are involved in a report that deals with agricultural commodities. And, and so, um, I believe we should celebrate this day, certainly in terms of the cannabis uh, industry, uh, but also as a, as a uh, county as a whole. We bring a lot of benefit uh, to the county uh, in terms of tax revenue, in terms of overall revenue that we turn into jobs, uh, uh, which are stable jobs, I, I would add. Uh, these are not seasonal. These are year-round jobs, and I would I would put the number of jobs that we have created in the thousands. Um, and so I'm I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I would like to to thank uh, uh, the two supervisors that have have worked on this report, uh, Supervisor Alejo and Supervisor Lopez. Uh, both of them have been instrumental uh, in uh, not only agricultural issues but also with uh, with the fair treatment of cannabis within this uh, within this paradigm, um, I'd also like to thank Henry Gonzalez, the Ag Commissioner, uh, and his staff, especially Jose Chang, uh, for the work that they've done. They've pressed us to get information. As you can imagine, this was not the it it was not easy to get cannabis growers to come forward with information right off the bat. Uh, it took a lot of uh, a lot of explaining what, what the crop report is. They are agriculturalists, um, but as you can imagine, they have a, a bit of, of hesitancy on, um, on what the ramifications are when they, when they step into the light as they have. Um, they've, met with, they've been met with high taxes, they've been met, met with high regulation, and so there was a bit of, uh, of hesitancy on their part to, uh, to to divulge where the market is, et cetera, because they, they uh, didn't want to necessarily become a target as a result of that. Um, but we have agreed since day one to be a transparent uh, organization, transparent <clears throat> uh, agricultural product, uh, because we have to be. This is a, it's a different product. It's not mainstream. It's not just row crops or you know, et cetera. This is uh, this is a highly regulated product because of, uh, but because of the effects of it potentially. So, uh, with that, I'm I'm proud of our industry. Uh, we have generated, as the numbers show, we've we uh, generated almost 450 million dollars uh, in in revenue. Uh, the tax revenue that was generated out of that. In, Last year was in the 14 to 15 million dollar range. Uh, this year it should be up in the 18 to 20 million dollar range based on uh, reports that we received at the uh, cannabis commi uh, committee. Um, that was a couple of weeks ago, and uh, which is a little more than what the crop report was estimating at the time we we worked on this. Um, uh, and so. Uh, I'd also like to thank Bob Roach from Monterey County Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, Joey, Bob, and I are the ones that really worked with our, our cultivators to obtain the information. Um, and it's important, you know, we, we'll stand by for questions on the particulars, but it is important to note that, uh, that the values that you see here 
are averages. It's not a very scientific method that we undertook. We did get a lot of responses from our growers. Um, I think that when you look at wine grapes and other commodities that you get a very high percentage of people who return their surveys to the Ag Commissioner's Office. And in our case, uh, you know, I think we're probably at 50, maybe 60% of our, our growers that, that participated. So we do have kind of a large margin of error that we should consider uh, in this. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I'll also explain just real quickly what products result out of this. Uh, it's very similar to uh, wine grapes in that you have different varieties of, of, uh, of plant material that are sold, uh, you know, similar to Cabernet Sauvignon or Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay. Uh, they have different values. They have uh, uh, different volumes in terms of growing. And so what we had, we didn't really ask our growers the particulars on that like you do in, in wine grapes in this report, uh, but but we, we do have just kind of global averages of price per pound. I think the price per pound was somewhere around $820 as an average. Uh, that was used together with the square feet and the, and the average weight of, of product that comes off the plant in that square feet. <clears throat> and so I'm very confident to say that we're a solid number five in the, uh, in the list of commodities that we have. Um, in order to be profitable, in order to be sustainable. That is, uh, as uh, Chris Valid, uh, Valadez said, you know, we seek to be sustainable. We wanna be here in the long term. And in order to do that, we have to be profitable. Um, the number that you see here actually reflected a losing uh, year. We had so many costs that were associated with the capital improvements necessary with the tax, et cetera. And so, uh, in my opinion, we need to be up at the $700 million range and, and we need to be uh, uh, threatening strawberries uh, as the second uh, agricultural commodity here and uh, in order to be sustainable for the, for the long term. So uh, all in all, you know, although the market wasn't very good for us uh, last year, it, it has improved, um, but we, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, over the next couple of years to really set our foundation. I think our, our board members, uh, uh, the Ag Commissioner's Office, the industry associations that we're working with have been taking this at a very, you know, have approached this at a very professional level and a very transparent level. And, uh, and I, we're set to uh, we, we're setting our foundation very well for a long-term successful venture. And again, one of the benefits I really see here is the fact that we are providing uh, year-round employment for people. Uh, that to me has been very important. I think some of the instability throughout the years having grown up here uh, has been a, a result of displaced families going back and forth uh, between Yuma and here. Um, it, I'm, I'm just proud to say that we've got people here that are that are being paid well, uh, that are here year round, and I think there are just other trickling benefits as a result of the industry being here, and it, and uh, it just marks an incredible, incredibly proud day for us. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, since uh, Bob Roach is uh, on this line and uh, is the executive director of the Monterey County Cannabis Industry Association, and he was instrumental in helping us uh, gather these numbers. Uh, uh, Bob was the, uh, uh, is the former assistant agricultural commissioner for Monterey County. So I'm gonna put him on the spot here and ask him if uh, he has any thoughts, uh, which I'm sure he does, uh, about the, the report uh, in particular about uh, cannabis production. I think Aaron covered it uh, very well, and I think he's right. This industry has a lot of potential for growth, and because of the way that our county um, went forward with cannabis, we're not seeing many of the, the problems that we're seeing in other areas, conflicts with the community. And I think he's right. I mean, we could be challenging strawberries in a very short period of time. And I'd also like to point out that the cannabis 
provides additional diversity to our agricultural and horticultural landscape. And that's very important. As one thing's up, other things down, can tend to even out. But the industry is still facing a few headwinds. Um, taxes are very high. Cost of compliance is higher than people expected. Um, and we have the illicit market that's, that's taking away some of their business. So those are headwinds we're facing, but we may have confidence that this industry is going to continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in the production of this report. Thank you, Bob. So now I'm going to open it up to the, uh, the media. And let me see if there's anything on the chat. Um, I don't see any questions on the chat. So, um, Henry, while you're waiting, yes. I, I would I would be remiss if I didn't thank the other people on this panel. Uh, we've worked together through on this crop report, but I think it's important to note that we also work together on uh, the advisory for agricultural employees on COVID-19. And uh, I had that in my notes, but I uh, I missed it uh, while I was talking. And so I, I just want to thank uh, uh, Kim and Colby and Carolyn and, and Chris and, and uh, everybody else from the different industries to, number one, to accept us into that fold, uh, especially on such an important topic as, as uh, protecting our employees in the face of COVID-19, but, um, but also the, uh, the collaboration that we have undertook, you know, that we undertook through that process over the last three or four months. So, so I wanted to thank everybody uh, while we're waiting. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, so uh, let's see, I see a question here um, from Michelle Loxton. Uh, this is to everyone. It says, Henry Dash Carolyn mentioned, despite coronavirus pandemic, they are anticipating another good year in 2020. Are you able to give any insights into how you, uh, the pandemic has affected uh, 2020. So uh, uh, Carolyn, you wanna talk about strawberries since you mentioned it and then I'll, I'll chime in a little bit. Sure, I'd be happy to do that, Henry. Um, so once we started to see coronavirus emerging here in the, on the West Coast and in the United States, um, strawberries were in full production in Southern California. So we had to hop on it right away and not wait for specific agriculture guidance coming out of any particular um, regulatory agency or public health agency to, so we took whatever information we could glean that would be um, appropriate to the fields and created a lot of training and information sources so that by the time production was happening up here in Monterey County, we already had a lot of pieces in place to, um, not only educate the workers about this is the best ways to keep yourself safe and healthy while you're at work and here's what we're doing in the workplace, but also take these practices home with you as well. So, um, and all of these things are built on our food safety program, which all the commodities have some kind of food safety program that include the elements of don't come to work if you're sick and proper hand washing techniques, which are two core um, practices to help spread, um, prevent the spread of COVID as well. So, um, you know, this, we're only halfway through the season. It still, re still remains to be seen what happens in terms of the spread of the virus. Um, but we feel like that we did early work, um, also working with the Monterey County folks who hopped on it well before the season really got going you know, up in this part of the state. And um, so, you know, barring any major issues, either in the labor force or with the weather, you know, there always could be something, an October surprise in terms of rain or things that can impact this as well. Very good. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank so you. I just want to add that uh, 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 ba uh, kind of what uh, Aaron was talking about was the, uh, the advisory that we created and pretty much uh, the folks that I've asked to participate on this call uh, are the are the advisory creators and uh, we jumped on this back in in mid-march uh, and put that out really quick uh, the advisory designed to uh, 
provide best practices for the industry on how to protect their workers. And that's been the key for us. And we recognize that from the very beginning. Had this been a, a virus uh, like the lettuce mosaic virus or the celery mosaic virus, a virus that was going to attack one of our crops, uh, we would have mobilized uh, to address that virus and that crop situation. But in this case with the coronavirus, uh, we knew that it was a virus that affects us uh, people uh, and key and critical to agriculture here in Monterey County are, are the people, the workers, the essential workers that uh, we all depend on to provide us uh, uh, food. And so uh, we knew that we had to jump on, on, on that aspect of this uh, pandemic and to focus our attention on, on taking care of the, uh, the workers here locally. And uh, as, as much effort as we have put into it, and we've put in a lot of effort, uh, nonetheless, uh, we knew it would happen that the that many farm workers would be uh, affected and, and they have been, uh, but we're still at it. We're still working with the industry and with the farm workers themselves and local advocacy groups to try to minimize those, those impacts on, on farm workers because ultimately it's an impact on not just the industry, but the community as, as well. So seeing early on that well, we, we were hearing uh, that certain crops were being impacted, that crops were not being harvested, that contracts were being canceled, that agriculture was being adversely impacted by the, the loss of the, of the uh, food service sector of uh, the industry. And so uh, what, what, I, what we did here uh, at the Ag Commissioner's Office is uh, we conducted a, a phone survey to get some better information, better data about what were the impacts uh, of being experienced uh, by the local growers. And so we, we did do this survey and found that that indeed uh, many of the growers were experiencing uh, losses uh, in a number of areas. First of all, the, uh, the loss of the, the food service sector. So some fields were, were not harvested uh, uh, at all because there was no, no, no use for it, no market for it, uh, with, the, with the closing of all the, the schools and hotels, motels, conventions, all of those mass uh, uh, events where there's a lot of people eating a lot of uh, our produce that wasn't gonna happen. So uh, there was a lot of that. Uh, and then it even impacted uh, uh, plans for planting uh, this, this season. Uh, and I, I saw a number of fields being uh, uh, being uh, uh, dist under, uh, even though they were not even close to, uh, to production. So, uh, so in addition to this this survey that we conducted, uh, we we will be gathering numbers for the entire year of uh, 2020, uh, the year of of COVID-19, and and that will be reflected in uh, our next crop report. So. So stay tuned uh, for next year. Uh, we'll be uh, reporting about that and provide with provide you all with uh, much more information uh, and the specific numbers that uh, that resulted uh, from the impacts of uh, the COVID nineteen. Uh, probably want to include something about uh, the the impacts to uh, to the workers as well as as that because so, I think that's a big part of the story of the COVID nineteen. I want to mention something that, uh, uh, just to uh, add a little more clarification to a comment that uh, Aaron made with regards to uh, the production of these uh, these numbers and, and where we got our information, et cetera. So, um, Ag Commissioners have been required to produce the, these crop reports annually for, and we've been doing this for, for decades. And it, it is exactly as Aaron said, uh, sometimes uh, growers won't return the surveys to us because although the agricultural commissioner is required by law to produce this report, there's nothing that says that anybody has to give me any of their information. So it's always a, a bit of a challenge to get all of that information. So what we do uh, in the cases where we don't get some information, well, we have other sources. Uh, where we can gather the information, certain choke points like the uh, uh, 
uh, California Strawberry Commission provides us with numbers on strawberries and uh, other, other such a groups will provide us with their numbers and we do comparisons and, and we try to fill the gaps like, okay, only f we only receive 50% of a particular commodity. Uh, how do we make up for that other 50%? Well, we, f we have information of all of the acres that are, are permitted. And so based on that information and other information that we have uh, to compare and contrast, uh, uh, we do our best to capture 100% of what was the production value for each and every uh, commodity. So anyway, uh, just wanted to add a little clarification uh, to that. Uh, so uh, with that, let's see, I think we have some other questions. Uh, let's see. Um, um, oh, so a question here, is enough being done to protect farm, protect workers from COVID-19? I get this question quite often. And I would say that um, there, no, that there, there is not enough being done. Could we do more? Yes, but it's always at a cost of, okay, you do this, uh, then what aren't you doing? And so it, it's always a balance as to try to fulfill all of the, the competing uh, uh, priorities that are out there. Certainly workers are a priority. And, and as I mentioned, we, we jumped on that back in, uh, in early March and have continued that effort. Uh, is it enough? Uh, no, it's never enough. Uh, uh, if anybody gets sick. Uh, but again, it's competing interests. Uh, we can only do so much. Uh, the industry can only do so much. Uh, the organizations, the individuals can only do so much. We have many competing interests, like I said. And so I think overall, I think we have focused a lot of attention, a lot of effort on the protection of the workers. And, and I'm very proud of that. As a former farm worker myself, uh, I can tell you that uh, the, the work that uh, the industry and county government and county health professionals and farm worker advocates have done uh, is, is, is a really great effort. Uh, next question is, uh, California, f oh, this is from, from Kobe. You're, you're asking the question or are you providing an answer here? Henry, I was just providing a report that was released this morning from California Farm Bureau and other industry partners like the, the Strawberry Commission. Um, the question had come up about COVID related impacts. And just as we were sitting here, um, this report was officially released. So I thought I would share it with the group for reference. Thank you. And uh, we'll be able to find that link on the Farm Bureau's uh, webpage. Or yes. Yeah, the link there um, should take you directly to the report. Very good. Thank you, Colby. You're uh, welcome. So we've answered a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to take a stab at the, the production year of 2020 question or the is enough being done to protect workers from COVID-19 question. Any, anybody? No? Okay, I don't see any other hands up. I'm looking. Does somebody have their hand up and I don't see it? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up. And so with that, I, I'm assuming that uh, we're good to go. And speaking of go- uh, You, get, you yeah. got Chris uh, raising his hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, I, I guess it, to me, it feels like it would be unfair to not add. I don't, I don't know if there's, there's any absolutes, um, you know, with regard to, to managing our way through through a pandemic and and what I'm what I'm seeing what I what I what I see what I believe and what what we can verify in many cases is that what is happening here you know in conjunction with with uh, uh, representatives from from the county led by Henry Gonzalez um, officials from the health department uh, industry associations industry employers um, worker advocacy organizations and healthcare leaders, particularly led by those that are leading the, the system of clinics here in the county that, that to me, there would appear to be um, 
a level of, of engagement uh, that has translated to action in a way that, that I am unaware that is happening anywhere else with this type of concerted effort and I think focus and intensity from all of those parties that are, that are, that have and continue to come together to help address uh, ongoing questions, whether it's relating to testing, employer engagement, uh, uh, the provision of PPE, securing more of it. I, I think, um, and I've, I can only through my own relationships validate what I think with, with folks that operate in other areas and in my relationship sitting on the, the State Board of Food and Ag advising Secretary Ross. And in those conversations, what I can pull out of that is what we are doing here um, is, is helping to set a model and I think serve as a model for, for other areas throughout California, particularly in other spots of California for just where, where they are, where they are where we were in March, you know, in March, you know, we were intersecting with, you know, the rise of the pandemic, the, the trigger actions by government to institute orders, and what really was a, a burgeoning intensity of, of labor to, to produce and, and harvest food. Um, you know, we, we kind of crash coursed there in, in mid-March, and, and here we are three or so months later, and so the model that we've set uh, I think can be learned from, is valuable, and, and can be enhanced here and, and, and more importantly elsewhere by, uh, by others um, who also have the responsibility and charge to continue to operate as an essential business and by doing so, protecting their workers to the extent they can um, while, while they have controls uh, at the work site and at the workplace and do all they can there. And I think, I think what we've done here um, is unique. Um, and I don't know if that's good or bad. I, I think it, it shouldn't be, hopefully, at the end of this pandemic that what we've done here has been borrowed, shared, and instituted elsewhere. For, but for at least this moment in time, um, what we've done here is, is definitely above beyond and beyond other regions. And, and I think we should, we should recognize that and, and use it to learn from and, and do more where we can. Uh, and, and I'll add one more thing to that, and that is that... Uh, we were first in the nation to come up with that advisory to, to growers on how best to protect their, their workers. I mean, we, we really jumped on it uh, in a big way. And thanks to all of the, the team of, uh, uh, that, the, that included uh, those on this uh, uh, industry panel and also uh, supervisors, uh, Chris Lopez and Luis Alejo. And, uh, Anyway, I'm very proud of that work. So, uh, Kim, your hand is up, I think. Uh, I, I, I actually think this is a great story um, because we do have an ethos that is different. I also work throughout the state that is very, very, very different than other regions. And I've reflected on why, why is that? What makes us different? One, we tend to be rule followers, I've noticed, more than other regions that are trying to work around the rules. We are rural creators, first of all, and then we are rural followers uh, because we care about our community. But, uh, and I, I thought about this a lot, and I think part of it is, you know, a lot of people in ag went to kindergarten together with everybody else in the community, right? So we have these long relationships. Look at Aaron's relationships in the community. And we are accountable, Kobe, you know, we are accountable to our neighbor in a way I don't think other people are in the state. And, and I think that's part of why we behave very differently. And, and I do think that that level of cooperation is worthy of a story in and of itself. With that, I want to uh, thank everyone uh, involved, uh, the creators of the report, the gatherers of the data, uh, all of you, uh, panelists and members of the media. Uh, just thank you so much uh, for this uh, opportunity and this wonderful uh, experience in these two uh, wonderful reports. Um, with that, I'm gonna sign off. Thank you, thank you all. <laughs>